I have a watercolour tutorial for you in this video. I'll be giving you 10 tips for brighter, more vibrant watercolours. Welcome back to my channel. If we have not met before, my name is Michelle. On this channel, you'll find all things watercolour as well as drawing tutorials, a little bit of mixed media, even business and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing, it's free. And if you click the little bell icon, you can get notified every time I have a new video for you. I make at least one free video here a week on YouTube on a Thursday with extra content for Patreon subscribers. Now, do you admire other people's watercolour paintings and think to yourself that they look so much brighter and more vibrant than your own paintings? Are you sometimes disappointed and think that the work that you produce just looks a little bit dull and a little bit mundane and you want that real bright watercolour glow that you see other people getting? I'm going to give you 10 tips in this video. So normally if you ask for advice on this subject, you'll be told, you know, two or three things change your water more often, perhaps use some staining colours. You may even be told that you need to throw all your paints away and buy new paints. I will be discussing all of these things in this video, but that's far from the whole answer. And I certainly wouldn't encourage anybody to throw all their paints away unless they've got really, really bad paints. So we'll be discussing each of these points and more. And the most important point, which is not anything I've mentioned so far, will be right at the end of the video. So number 10 is going to be the most important thing that I think you need to do to make your paints look brighter and more vibrant. So let's get started and we'll start with number one. So let's talk first about staining watercolours. This is what people say you need, isn't it? Staining colours. So let's talk about what they are. I'm going to point the camera downwards and show you. It's not brand specific and it certainly isn't the whole answer to getting brighter, vibrant paintings, but it is an important thing to be aware of. So let's have a look at staining colours first. So what constitutes a staining colour and how do you identify it? I'm going to swatch two colours here. One is a staining colour and one is not. So I've got this phthalo blue here. So this is my beginner's essential set of watercolours that I designed in collaboration with Jackman's Art Materials. If you would like to find out more about these paints, they're in the video description. So here's your phthalo blue. What you'll notice about a staining colour is it looks somewhat like ink. It's strong. It doesn't have um, that heavy granulation that you get with some watercolours. And uh, just as its name suggests, if you try to remove it from the paper by scrubbing it out later on, it's going to be very difficult to remove. So that's a staining colour. Let me now swatch. I'll swatch ultramarine just so that we are on the same colour palette. We're on the blues. Again, it's a strong colour. It does granulate and it's just not quite as ink-like. So that's ultramarine. Let me show you a yellow that is also non-granulating. So I'm going to swatch yellow ochre. Now, yellow ochre is also considered to be an earth colour, and this is definitely a semi-opaque. So if I put this one down here like this, you'll see that although they're nice bright colours, none of them glow quite as much as the staining colour. Now, another way you can tell staining colours is simply by the name, because certain pigments are considered to be staining pigments, and they go across all brands. So in other words, Thalo blue and also thalo green across all brands is a staining colour. That doesn't mean it's the same in all brands. Each brand will vary slightly even within the same pigment number. But all thalo blues and thalo greens are staining colours. So there you have almost the way it's made. Often a staining colour will be a synthetic colour. You also have things like quinacridones. So you have things like quinacridone rose. Permanent rose is also a staining colour. So I'll run through a few of the most common ones and I'll tell you which ones you should probably add to your paint box. Now it's misguided to try and exclude all other paints and just paint the staining colours. There's really no need for it and I'll be explaining more about that later on in the video. But let's go through some staining colours. So within the blues you have the thalos and you have Prussian blue. Those are your staining blues. This is not an extensive list because there could be you know 20 or 30 types of blue. But I'm just telling you the most common ones. Within your reds, you're looking at your permanent rose, some of your scarlet reds and things like opera rose, also quinacridone rose. Those are your staining reds. Within the yellows, they're mostly the warm yellows. So things like transparent yellow and Indian yellow. 
If you can hear the wind, by the way, I do apologise. We have the weather today is completely schizophrenic. One minute it's uh, one minute it's bright blue skies and sunshine. The next minute we've got storms and things. So um, apologies for any background noises while I'm filming today and any changes in light levels. You'll find that within the muted colours, so in other words, within the ochres and the earth colours, there are very few staining colours. So most of your staining colours are within the primaries, also secondaries. So you've got some of your oranges. You've certainly got your phthalo based greens, colours that are often labelled viridian, but are in fact phthalo. And then, of course, you've got your purples. So very strong purples, things like permanent blue violet are staining colours too. Now, where it gets a little bit difficult is when you get into mixed colours. So colours like Payne's Grey, in other words, a colour that has multiple pigments in and is mixed to each manufacturer's recipe. So each manufacturer makes it a little bit more differently. So in colours like that, it's best to swatch. And I do encourage you to swatch all of your colours anyway. Now, if you don't have any staining pigments, so if you've got a beginner's set and your only blues are ultramarine and cerulean and your only reds are things like alizarin or red oxide, then you want to add a few more colours. So the two that I would find most useful for mixing would be phthalo blue. Of course, you can make a green from it and also a permanent rose or a quinacridone rose. So those two colours I would really think about adding to your box. Prussian blue can be very useful also. So if you don't have any staining colours, you want to consider adding two or three to your painting box. So the next tip I have for you is to water down some of your brighter colours a bit more. That sounds very counterintuitive, doesn't it? You might think to yourself, the more of the pigment you use, the more of the colour you use, the brighter your work is going to look, but that's not necessarily the case. Let me explain why you should possibly be adding a little bit more water to your colours. So why on earth would you water down colours in order to make them brighter? Well, it's all about allowing the paper to show through. So let's look at this. Um, I've got some permanent rose here, which is a staining colour. And let's look at it. First of all, let's look at it really very weak indeed. So, you know, we could be very pale, so pale that we could barely see it. That's not going to have a lot of impact. But what people often do, I see this particularly um, if people are doing something like a garden painting and there are some red or pink flowers or some purple flowers, what they'll do is they'll want them to be really bright. So they'll pick up a ton of pigment on their paintbrush, maybe even straight from the tube, and they'll layer that pigment on as darkly as possible. So I'm trying to pick up, it's very difficult because I've got too much water in here already, but I'm trying to pick up really strong pink paint and go really dark. So there we are, really dark paint. Now the problem with that is it is so dark and often by the end of the painting, it really doesn't seem to show up very brightly. You've almost layered it too thickly. So what you're looking for is somewhere in between. So I've added more water to my brush and see what happens when we have just a little bit more water. Now I hope you can see that this color here looks much brighter than this color here, even though we have more pigment in this one. So don't fall into the trap of thinking the darker you go with your colour, the stronger you go with your colour, the brighter it will glow. You do want strong colour, but you also want enough water that it flows across the paper and that the white of the paper shows through and that's going to help it to glow. So let's talk next about the quality of your paints. Now it's easy to say, well, you just need to buy better quality paints, but it's not quite as simple as that. In a student's range, for example, there'll be some good colours and some colours that are not so good. And this is because different pigments cost different amounts of money. And so manufacturers will swap out the expensive pigments, but they may leave in the cheap pigments. I'm going to point the camera downwards and explain exactly what I mean and which colours you might need to add to your paint box in order to get brighter, more vibrant paintings. At this point, if you're getting some value from this video, if you like this video, could you please show that you like it by clicking that thumbs up, clicking that like button for me. It really helps me with the YouTube algorithm. If you can like, share, subscribe, or leave me a comment, YouTube will push this video out to more people. I'm so grateful to all of you who watch me here on YouTube. So let's talk about using better quality paints and what you really do need to buy. Now, if you're using um, what I would call a, uh, in America, you'd call it a drugstore brand perhaps, or in England, it would be a stationer's. So in other words, one of these shops, we have them in the UK, like the Range, the Works. I'm talking about your Walmart type shops, shops that are just um, sell general uh, objects, shall we say, and maybe have some paints as well. 
Now, some of the shops are in the UK, we have the range and it also sells things like Windsor and Newton. So you're looking at your good brands there, but these general shops can often sell really, really cheap paints and they can be a bit disingenuous about it. Sometimes they'll label them with these fancy names. We have a, uh, a shop in the UK called The Works, does lots of stationery books, things like that. And they have their own branded art materials. They're called Canson and Black. They look lovely. You know, they really look impressive, but the truth is that they're not very good. So what you want to do is you want to stop paying basically for packaging. Now, what you find with all of the very cheap brands is that the packaging can often look great. Now, the reason for this is if you're an art materials manufacturer, the most expensive thing to buy is the pigment. Everything else is peripheral. So you can get these cheaper brands. You may have bought beautiful looking sets of watercolor pencils, for example. You think, well, that's really cheap and I get so many and look at this lovely case it's in. And then you find they're just a bit wishy-washy and don't have a lot of pigment. So you want to steer clear of those unbranded or own brand paints. Then you go up to the next level, which would be student quality. And then finally, at the top of the range, you have artist quality. Now, if you have artist quality paints, you're on a home run. However, that doesn't mean you're going to like every single paint in that range because they do vary. So if, for example, you find that you don't like one of the blues, do think about going into another range. You know, some people get very pernickety about like sticking within one range. There's really no need to for watercolors. Of course, we all have our favorite ranges. But if you do find that one color from that range, you're just endlessly disappointed with it, do try it from another range. Now let's go back to those student quality paints, which many people start with. The majority of them are really very good but they are not all created equally. I mean, within the same range. So if you have a student's quality set of paints, what you're gonna find is that the cheaper pigments, the earth pigments are probably fairly reasonable quality because they don't cost the manufacturer as much money. Now, when you look at the more expensive pigments, especially things like ultramarine, cerulean blue is a real, real tell. There's very few good cerulean blues out there. If you have a cheaper set of paints or a student set of paints, and your cerulean blue is not very good, or your ultramarine just looks really murky, you want to consider swapping up to an artist brand. Now, the paints that I work with that I put out under my name, under my brand, are all artist quality. And again, they're all compatible with other brands. So if you're working with a student's range of paints, there is no need to throw them all out but do have a look particularly at some of those more expensive pigments or just any pigments. You know, if you swatch the whole set and you just find that one or two pigments you're not happy with, it may be worth just going up to the artist's quality. And if you're looking to transition to artist's quality without costing yourself tons of money immediately, what I would do is each time one of your students' quality paints runs out, I would replace that with an artist's quality because paints don't run out at the same rate. Some colors like Payne's Gray, Thalo Blue seem to go on forever. Other colors like Lemon Yellow, Cerulean Blue will run out pretty quickly because they are weaker. So as one of those runs out, you could consider swapping up. But if you're happy with your students' quality brand, then that's fine. Just make sure you've got a few staining colors and make sure that any colors within that brand that you think are a little bit dull, do consider trying them in a better brand. You may be surprised at the difference. So tip four is to change your water more often, but we can say more about it than that. When is it important to change your water and what tactics can you use to ensure that you're not getting up and walking over to the sink literally between every single brush stroke? So let's talk about changing water. Now, even a water like this that's only got a little bit of color in can dull down your colors if you're using a particularly different color. So this water here is sort of um, a purpley color. If I'm mixing more pinks or more purples, I'm not really going to worry about the color of this water. It's fine, I can just carry on. However, if I'm gonna mix something like a really light yellow, an orange, a green perhaps, something that's noticeably different to this color water, then I need to change the water, even though it hasn't got that much paint in. So this is what you want to think about. Are the colors that you're mixing close to the color of the water in your jar? If so, you're probably okay to proceed. If they're very, very different, then that's the time you change your water. Now, the changing of the water process can be slowed down and the cleanliness of the brush can be added to, shall we say, by using two water jars. So I've got this big water jar here. So what I tend to do is I have one water jar that I use for rinsing my paintbrush, and then I could either use the second water jar for a second rinse 
All what I could do is keep one water jar or even a third water jar just for clean water. If I'm doing something on a painting where I need to keep adding clean water, I'll make sure I have a separate jar for that. So you always want to, if you're at home and it's practical to do so, always have more than one uh, water jar available. Of course, the more water, then the more the paint is diluted as it goes in and the less you're polluting your paints and your painting. Somebody gave me these, uh, gave me a couple of these years ago. They worked in a factory and they had uh, these huge plastic tubs. But of course, things like large yogurt tubs will do just as well. So I always advise you to have at least two water jars on the go. And the time to change your water is either when you notice it looks like soup. If your water ever looks like soup, get shot of it. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've walked around my classroom and somebody says to me, oh, you know, I have no idea what's making my colours so murky. And their water, it looks like the bottom of a pond. It's disgusting. But even if your water only has a little bit of paint in like this, if you're changing to a noticeably different colour, if your water is yellow and you're going to purple paint, or if your water is green, you're going to red or orange paint, then that's the time to change your water. Even a slight amount of paint in your water can dull your colours down. As I said, you'll get away with it if it's a very close colour. Otherwise, change your water. Now, I know some of you who watch me um, have health issues and perhaps you might be bed bound or you can't uh, move around, you know, you can't get up 20 times to change your water. What I suggest you do is work with much smaller water pots. In other words, work, work with tiny little pots, something like those little um, hummus pots that you get or the little takeaway food pots that you get. Clean, obviously. Don't be, uh, don't be painting with korma sauce. I don't encourage that at all. Get some of those little pots and then you want to have a large sort of um, bucket beside you and um, a bottle of water. You know, set yourself up at the start of your painting session and then you can just constantly tip out the water and refill it from the bottle. So that's what I advise if it's not uh, convenient for you to keep getting up to change your water. There's no excuse for not changing your water often. It really does affect how bright your paintings look. Tip five is to clean your palette. And again, how often should you be doing this? When should you be doing this? When is it important to do this? Let me point the camera downwards and explain. And this is something along with the last point that I've seen my students do time and time again, you know, I'm walking around a classroom and they'll say, oh, I cannot understand why I'm getting such murky colors and their water looks like soup and their paint palette looks like they haven't cleaned it since 1973. So again, let me explain to you when and how you should clean your palette. So let's talk about cleaning palettes. Now here's one that I'm using at the moment for a uh, Patreon painting for one of my own paintings. You see, I've only got a couple of colors here because some of them are actually in little sample pots. I'm using those directly from the pots. And you can see, you know, all of the mess and some of the colors start to get mucky. And then if we contrast it, this palette here, although I've mixed some green in the middle, this is fairly clean because I have cleaned it. This palette has been in a mess numerous times. So I have a rule and the rule for me is that I clean my palette after the end of each painting. Now you can see that these were tube paints, but they've been squeezed out and they've gone hard. Now I often see people ask, why on earth if you have tube paints, would you squeeze them out and let them go hard? You may as well just get pan paints. Well, the truth is it's just a bit more easy to clean them this way. And the reason we don't just get pan paints is because you still have the option when you need a lot of paint of getting some directly from the tube. Because if you have a huge sky to paint, you know, a little bit of scrubbing in one of these blues is not going to cut it. You're going to need that fresh tube paint in the middle or in another container. So a tube paint will give you versatility. But if you do have tube paints or even if you're using pan paints and they get mucky, what happens then is you can just clean the top layer off. You know, literally put them under a tap, get a toothbrush on them and clean them up. So that's my rule is clean your palette when you finish each project and then you never get to that point. You know, I do see people mixing in palettes that just literally are never cleaned, particularly those little pan palettes where you have the lift off lid, the tins and, you know, the lid has all been used for mixing and they'll just wipe it out and mix in the middle. It's very, very poor palette hygiene. You want to keep your colours as pure as possible in order to get the brightest possible results. Now, there's no point having clean water and a clean palette if you don't paint cleanly. So what do I mean about painting cleanly? Of course, it's not practical to clean your paintbrush in your water jar every single time you dip into a colour. You know, we're not perfect. And again, that would just uh, dilute all your colours anyway. So let me explain to you what I mean by painting cleanly and the practicalities of it and how it's going to make a difference to your painting practice. 
So let's go back to my previously used palette and talk about painting cleanly. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is you see this colour here, I've got a load of blue in it. You can see I have not been the perfect artist. I've not rinsed my paintbrush in between um, using the yellow and using the blue. As I said, this paint is dried, so it'll just be sitting on top. So you want to be considering if I've got a small amount of yellow here and I know that I'm going to be mixing greens for days, I'm not too worried about getting a bit of blue in it. But if I just want to mix a little bit of green and then I know I'm going to be using that yellow to mix orange from, I certainly wouldn't do this. What I would do is take a bit of that yellow paint, place it into the well, mix my green up separately and keep that as pure yellow. So in other words, put a clean paintbrush in it. The other thing you want to be careful of is if you have tube paint that's just literally been squeezed out, you don't want to, you see, if I put blue on this, I've got some green on the surface, but if this was wet yellow paint and I put blue into the middle of it, then I've polluted all of that puddle of paint. So if you've got freshly squeezed paint, what I would tend to do is scoop some out and place it in the well what you're working in so that you have access to it and can add bits of it when you need to. So it's not practical to just keep rinsing your paintbrush every single time you touch one of your paint walls, but do have consideration to what colors you're mixing, what colors you're mixing next, and keeping that paint as pure as you can whilst you're mixing from it. Now I'm mixing greens at the moment. I have a red tomato to paint. I'm painting tomatoes, believe it or not, next. And I certainly won't be mixing, if I want some yellow in that red, I certainly won't be just putting my paintbrush in here and grabbing all this mucky paint because that will be a very bad idea and it'll just dull everything down. So whilst you're painting, do try to paint cleanly and rinse your paintbrush when you feel it's effective to do so. So tip number seven, unless you have a particular reason for doing so, you need to keep opposite colours on your palette apart. What are opposite colours and why is it so important to keep them separate? I'm going to point the camera downwards and show you some examples of what happens when opposite colours in your palette get mixed together. So I hinted at it in the last clip about changing water, but you want to keep colour opposites apart. So there are three sets of colour opposites. You have red and green you have blue and orange, and you have yellow and purple. Don't worry if you can't remember those, I'll put them in the video description so you can uh, cut and paste them or just read them or write them down or something. But you need to keep those colors apart. So let's look at some basic color theory. Now color opposites are always a combination of all three primaries by one way or another. So one of those colors will have one primary in and the other color will have two primaries in. So let's look at, um, let's look at one mix. So let's look at purple and its opposite is yellow. So where are the primaries? Well here you have the yellow and in the purple you have blue and red because those are the colours that make purple. So now you have all three primaries. What happens if you mix all three primary colours together? You get mud basically, you get a muted colour, you get a neutral. You get either a grey if the majority of the mix is blue pigment or you'll get a brown if there's a lot more red and yellow in. So that's what happens within these colour opposites is you are adding the third primary in if you add one colour opposite to another. It works with all of them. You can have a go yourself. You know, think about green and red. You've got red and then in the green you've got blue and yellow. So there's your three primaries. So it works for all of them and by adding one to the other you are neutralizing or muting the color. So let's look at it actually on the paper. So I had a bit of green here, so let's just make the most of that and mix a bit more green. So here's some green and its color opposite is red. So let's paint it on the paper. So here's my green and I'll show you my red. Okay, so let's look what happens if we just get a little bit of that red in with the green. What will happen is you'll start to neutralize that color and dull it down. And the same is vice versa. See how nice and bright this red is? Let's dump some green in it and oh, look at that. Now, it's not that these color mixes are wrong. If you're looking for neutrals, well, there you go. You've made a nice gray. But if you're looking for bright greens and bright reds, you need to keep them apart. So do make a note of your color opposites and keep them apart, particularly in your palette. For instance, if I've got this here, you know, what I don't want to do is get a piece of tissue paper, you know, wipe it out like that and then I'm mixing some red in here. You're just going to dull down your colour. 
So make a note of your colour opposites and vow to keep them separate within your palette. And if you have a well like this and you need to mix another colour in it, what you want to do is clean it, and I mean clean it properly. So don't just wipe it and leave it like that. You need to make sure you get every single scrap of it off that there's no green left. Of course, the palette is somewhat stained because it's a plastic palette, but there we are, nice, clean mixing well. And that's what you should be mixing your new colour on, not a load of old stuff. And of course, this goes for, you know, muted colours as well. If you had previously had greys and browns there, well, obviously that's going to kill your colours too. But it's really important to keep those colour opposites apart. Now this next tip almost contradicts the last tip, so I've told you to keep opposite colours apart in your palette unless you're making specific mixes, but actually placing opposite colours separately next to each other within a painting can make your paints look brighter. Let me explain why that is. So colour opposites are interesting. As I said, they mute each other when mixed together. However, when not mixed together, they play off against each other. And if you, for instance, have a painting with an awful lot of green in, then having a little bit of bright red can really make it sing. So let's put our red here. And this time we're not going to mix the colours together. We're going to keep them separate. Let's have some of this diaryllide yellow, actually. But we're going to place them next to each other in the painting. Placing colour opposites next to each other is a great idea, particularly if you have a focal point you want to draw attention to. They can be used as almost place markers to take the eye through the painting. I often do this in seascapes where you might have bright orange buoys or markers and you can take them in against that blue sea. Really, really good idea to let colour opposites sit next to each other in your painting, particularly in focal areas. Don't allow them to mix together unless you're looking for a muted colour, but do place them in the picture next to each other. You'll get really, really vibrant results. So my next tip is completely counterintuitive, and that's to use more dull, more opaque, and more dark colors in your painting. So I'm gonna put a photo up here of a stained glass window. Now, why does stained glass look so bright and so beautiful? There's several reasons for it. One, the light is shining through it. We've spoken already in this video about getting the paper, you know, shining, the white of the paper shining through your paints. But the other reason that stained glass looks so beautiful is because it's surrounded by darks. It's surrounded by that dark, dull, very, very opaque brickwork. Now, if you took the stained glass window out of the church and laid it, for example, on the grass, it would still look pretty, but the colors wouldn't glow in the same way. And so this idea of only using staining colors and only using bright colors doesn't really work because yes, you can get a very bright painting, but it never really has that impact and that drama and that glow. So I do encourage you not to mix muddy, opaque colors through everything. We've already spoken about keeping your palette clean, but to have these colors in contrast to the brighter, clearer, more staining colors can be just what you need to make your painting look more vibrant, look brighter. It makes sunsets glow. If you're painting a sunset, it doesn't matter how bright your yellows and pinks are. If you don't have some strong darks next to them, you're never going to get that feeling of light. You know, people often see my sunset paintings and they ask me, what's the trick to making it glow? There is no trick. It's just a matter of the darker, dull colors offsetting those beautiful brights. So at the beginning of this video, I told you that I would give you the most important tip last. The most important tip for making your colors look brighter is to get tonal contrast correct. If you ever go to maybe an amateur art exhibition and you're looking at the paintings and thinking, well, you know, they're okay, but they just look a bit nondescript, it's always tonal contrast. Tonal contrast is something that all professional artists have got right. It doesn't matter what medium you're looking at, there'll always be strong tonal contrast. Even if you're looking at a painting with muted, duller colors, it's the tonal contrast that makes it come alive. And this is so, so important. Now, it's really, really difficult when you're starting a painting because you're starting on pure white paper. And so there's a tendency when you put those first colors down, because of course in watercolors, working light to dark, when you put those first colors down, there's a tendency to think that they're not strong enough, that they're not bright enough. But sometimes they need to be pale 
in order to be shown up by darks later on. So it's a little bit like a game of chess. You have to be working several steps ahead and you have to be thinking not how bright does this colour look now against the white paper, which may not be very bright, but how bright will this colour look when I've got darks around it? And that is one of the most fundamental ways of getting a good painting. Tonal contrast all the way. If you look at an amateur painting and you think, well, the drawing's okay, the painting's okay, but I don't think it looks that interesting, but I can't see why, have a look at the tonal contrast. It's nearly always the answer. And the answer to getting brighter watercolours, even if you haven't got the best paints in the world, it's nearly always tonal contrast. Now, before you leave this video, don't forget to pop into the video description. So that's just below the video. If you click the little down arrow to expand it out, you'll find lots of good free stuff in there. I have a free online mini course that you can take. Yes, completely free. You can paint a beautiful rose with me. I also have some downloadable PDFs that you can grab for no money whatsoever. One of the main things that we need to paint are greens. We have lots of greens around us in the landscape and it's important that they look bright and vibrant or dull and muted when we need them to. I've got a video that's going to help you to paint better greens. You can watch that video right now.